Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to our channel. If you're new here, please consider subscribing. It really helps me out and allows us to continue bringing you awesome content. So grab your favorite snack, get comfortable, and let's dive right in. Thanks for joining us. The morning began just like any other, with the sharp buzz of the alarm clock dragging me out of sleep. I shuffled to the kitchen, still half asleep to make myself some coffee. But today wasn't going to be just another day. As I passed the hallway, a knock at the door caught my attention, a sharp, urgent sound that seemed out of place in the quiet morning. I opened the door, only to find a delivery man holding a package, his expression blank and uninterested. Theo Donatelli, he asked. I nodded, signing for the package that was unexpectedly addressed to me from a sender whose name wasn't mentioned. The delivery man turned away, leaving me with the package in my hands. The weight of it was surprising, heavier than it looked. Back inside, I placed the box on the dining table. The cardboard felt cold, almost ominous. The mystery deepened as I noticed the return address. It was from my mother, Evangeline Donatelli. My heart skipped a beat. She had disappeared a week ago, vanishing without a trace, and under circumstances that whispered of secrets I never knew she held. The police had no leads, and the lingering questions had haunted every waking moment of mine since. With a mixture of apprehension and urgency, I tore open the package. Inside was a letter, written in my mother's elegant script, and beneath it, a bodysuit that looked disturbingly lifelike. I picked up the letter first, the paper feeling brittle in my anxious fingers. Dear Theo, it began, I know it must be a shock to see this. I've always kept a part of my life hidden, a part that now I need you to step into. Please don't be upset. I haven't left you forever. I just need you to be me for a while. The letter trembled in my hands as I continued reading. She explained that this bodysuit was a sophisticated piece of technology that could transform me into a perfect replica of her. She pleaded with me to wear it, to become her, to live her life until she could return. The reasons why were vague, shrouded in cryptic phrases and urgent pleas. Underneath the letter, the bodysuit lay folded with care, its material smooth and eerily akin to human skin. I hesitated, my mind racing with confusion and fear. How could this be possible? Was this some kind of joke or a misunderstanding? Yet the desperation in my mother's words was clear. She needed me. Whatever this thing was, whatever life she led that required such a disguise, she was entrusting it to me. The weight of her request settled on my shoulders like a heavy cloak. With a deep breath, I decided I would do it. I would become Evangeline Donatelli for her, for my mother. Whatever secrets awaited me in her world, I would face them as her, hoping that in doing so, I might find her once again. The decision made, I reached for the bodysuit, my fingers tracing the lines that would soon define my new exterior. The transformation was about to begin, and with it, a journey into a life I never knew my mother had. Alone in the quiet of my apartment, the decision to step into my mother's skin took on a surreal quality. I held the bodysuit up against the light, its contours and details mimicking human flesh with unsettling accuracy. It was then, in the solitude of that morning, that I felt a surge of curiosity mixed with a pang of excitement, a feeling that had lingered in the shadows of my consciousness for years. Since childhood, I'd been captivated by my mother's elegance and beauty. She moved through life with such poise and confidence that it seemed almost magical to me. There were moments, secret and shrouded in the privacy of my thoughts, where I imagined what it might be like to embody such grace. These weren't thoughts I'd ever shared, nor had I acted on them, until now. Taking a deep breath, I began the process of transformation. I undressed, my hands slightly trembling, not just from nervousness, but from a burgeoning realization of the step I was about to take. The bodysuit lay open, inviting and intimidating. The interior was lined with a soft, intricate network of sensors and materials that promised to make the change not just external, but deeply immersive. I stepped into the bodysuit, first one leg, then the other, pulling it carefully up over my knees, my waist, and then my shoulders. The sensation was odd, 
like slipping into a second skin that knew more about my mother than I ever could. As I zipped up the back, a faint hum began within the fabric, and the transformation initiated. The change was nothing short of miraculous. It was as if every cell in my body was being reconfigured, my chest tightened, then released, now adorned with the gentle curves of my mother's figure. My face tingled as the bones and skin reshaped themselves, my jawline softening, my lips plumping slightly. When I looked in the mirror, Theo was gone. In his place stood Evangeline Donatelli, as real and as vivid as any day I saw her dressed for a gala or a meeting. The shock of seeing her, of seeing me as her, was overwhelming. My eyes, now a deeper shade of hazel, stared back at me with a mix of fear and fascination. I turned, observing the profile, the way the dress fell across the hips I now possessed, the elegant line of the neck I knew from countless photos and memories. Hello, Mom, I whispered to my reflection, my voice now a perfect echo of hers. It was disconcerting to hear her voice come from my lips, to see her gestures mirrored by my hands. But beyond the physical transformation, I felt a subtle shift inside, as if wearing her appearance brought with it a touch of her essence, her spirit. Tasked with living her life, I felt a responsibility settle on my transformed shoulders. There were so many questions. Where had she gone? What life had she been leading that necessitated such a disguise? And most importantly, could I truly step into her shoes, not just in appearance, but in action? As I practiced her smile, her laugh, and the way she tucked a stray lock of hair behind her ear, I realized this was more than just wearing a costume. I was to become her, at least for a while, to protect her life, her secrets, and perhaps to understand the mysteries she had left behind. With a final look in the mirror, I nodded to myself, to her, and prepared to step out into the world as Evangeline Donatelli. The door to my old life closed with a soft click behind me, and the door to her world swung wide open. The adventure was just beginning. Stepping out into the sunlight as Evangeline, I felt every gaze a little more intensely, each whisper seemed louder, and the world felt sharply focused, as if I was seeing it through a new lens. My first task was clear. I had to manage her art gallery, a place where she was more than just a name. She was an institution. The gallery was located in the heart of the city, a modern building with sleek lines and large windows that let in the morning light beautifully. As I approached, my heart thumped with a mix of nerves and anticipation. The staff knew Evangeline well, but Theo was a stranger to these polished floors and curated walls. Good morning, Miss Donatelli, greeted Michael, the assistant who had worked with my mother for years. His eyes scanned my face, looking for the familiar warmth of Evangeline's smile. I returned his greeting with a nod and a smile, mimicking the way she would have done it, the memory of her gestures guiding me. As I walked through the gallery, I was met with nods and smiles, the staff busily preparing for an upcoming exhibition. The art was stunning, a mix of modern and classical pieces that spoke of my mother's eclectic tastes, a side of her I barely knew. Throughout the day, I faced a myriad of tasks that Evangeline handled with grace, but were foreign to me. There were decisions about lighting, queries from artists, and negotiations with buyers. Each decision felt like walking a tightrope, balancing between what I thought was right and what I believed she would have done. The real challenge came when I had to interact with patrons and artists who knew Evangeline well. One particular artist, a fiery woman named Clara, demanded why her pieces were not featured more prominently in the new exhibit. I stumbled through my response, using vague affirmations and nods, trying desperately to channel Evangeline's diplomatic charm. Clara squinted at me suspiciously, but eventually seemed to accept my explanations. Every interaction was a lesson, each moment a rapid education in the life my mother led. The way she spoke, the slight tilt of her head when listening, even the firmness of her handshake, these were all traits I had to adopt quickly. It was exhausting and exhilarating, like playing a part on stage without ever having rehearsed. As the day wound down, I retreated to my mother's office, a sanctuary filled with her personal touches. There were photos of us, art books scattered about, and sketches that she must have doodled in idle moments. Sitting at her desk, I felt closer to her than ever before, yet the secrets she kept felt like walls between us. 
The realization hit me then, surrounded by the remnants of her day-to-day -day life. I didn't just wear her appearance. I had to carry her legacy, protect her creations, and uphold her relationships. The responsibility was immense, not just to act as her, but to honor what she built with such passion. In the quiet of the office, I found a deeper respect for the woman I called mom, and a burgeoning desire to understand not just who she was in public, but the woman behind the curtain. Each step in her world was a step closer to unraveling the mystery of her disappearance, and perhaps a step closer to finding her again. As the days blended into weeks, my role as Evangeline not only grew more comfortable, but also more complicated. Every conversation, every drawer I dared open in her neatly organized office seemed to unveil another layer of a life that was both mesmerizing and mystifying. One rainy afternoon, as the gallery buzzed quietly with the soft footfalls of visitors and the subdued discussions of art aficionados, I decided to tackle the backlog of paperwork that had accumulated. Evangeline's office was a sanctuary of sorts, but also a treasure trove of her professional and personal life. As I sorted through the files and documents, a hidden drawer that refused to open on previous attempts suddenly slid free. Inside, I found an assortment of letters and financial statements that painted a starkly different picture of my mother's life. The first few letters were from a bank, written with the kind of stern politeness that thinly veiled the seriousness of their content. Evangeline was in debt, and not just trivial amounts. The figures on the pages made my head spin, debts incurred from what appeared to be failed investments in other art ventures, some so risky they bordered on reckless. It struck me then, her confident exterior at social events, her celebrated acumen in the art world, masked a gambler's panic just beneath the surface. As I dug deeper into the drawer, I came across a series of personal letters that were tied together with a red ribbon, slightly faded with age. The handwriting was not my mother's. With a hesitating hand, I untied the ribbon and read the first letter. It was from a man named Marco. His words were filled with affection and longing, describing clandestine meetings and shared dreams of a future together, away from the prying eyes of the public. Marco. I had never heard her mention his name, not in passing, not even when she spoke of old friends. Each letter unfolded more of their story, an affair that spanned years, hidden so carefully behind the facade of her public life. The last piece of the puzzle came in the form of a medical report, tucked away at the very back of the drawer. It detailed a series of treatments for a condition she had kept to herself. The reports were recent and spoke of a struggle that she faced alone, without leaning on anyone, not even me. The realization that she carried such a burden in silence was overwhelming. Sitting back in her chair, surrounded by the remnants of these revelations, I felt a profound sadness mixed with admiration. Evangeline, my mother, the pillar of strength and success, had been balancing on a tightrope of her own making. Each secret was a knot on that rope, each hidden truth a testament to her resolve to protect her family, me, from the realities that weighed her down. These discoveries reshaped my understanding of her. They added depth to her laughter, gravity to her silences, and an indelible complexity to the memories I held dear. The Evangeline I knew was both less and more than I had imagined, less the invincible matriarch and more the human flawed and fierce. Armed with these insights, I felt a renewed determination to keep the gallery afloat, to resolve her debts, and to protect her legacy. But beyond the professional veneer, there was a more personal quest unfolding, a quest to reconcile the image of the mother I knew with the woman revealed in these hidden documents. And somewhere, amidst the art and the secrets, I hoped to find not just answers about her disappearance, but also about the life she truly led. The gallery was alive with the vibrant buzz of an opening night. The walls glowed with carefully lit artworks, and the air was filled with a mix of perfume, wine, and the soft murmur of the city's art enthusiasts. I circulated through the crowd, maintaining Evangeline's graceful composure, my mind replaying every detail I had learned from her letters and documents to ensure her persona did not slip. 
just as I was beginning to feel comfortable in the whirl of conversations and congratulations, the evening took an unexpected turn. I felt a hand on my shoulder and turned to find myself looking into the eyes of a man whose presence I had not anticipated, Sergio, Evangeline's ex-lover. The shock of seeing him was palpable, his familiar gaze unsettling me deeply. Evangeline, you look as radiant as ever, Sergio said, his voice a smooth baritone that carried an undercurrent of intimacy I was wholly unprepared for. His eyes scanned my face, searching for recognition, for the connection they once shared. I struggled to find my footing in the conversation, aware that any misstep could reveal my true identity. Sergio, it's been a long time. How have you been? I managed, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. His smile was both wistful and knowing. Too long indeed. I've missed our talks, Evangeline. There's so much to catch up on. His familiarity tugged at memories that were not mine, stirring emotions that Evangeline had evidently felt strongly. As the evening progressed, Sergio remained close by, reminiscing about past events and inside jokes that I navigated cautiously, piecing together responses from the fragments of Evangeline's life I had uncovered. With each shared memory, I could see the lines of the past blurring, the old flames flickering in his eyes, challenging my understanding of the woman I was portraying. The real complication arose when he brought up a trip they had planned but never took, his tone suggesting it was a deeply cherished dream. Do you ever think about Morocco, Evangeline? About the adventure we promised ourselves, he asked, his voice low and compelling. I hesitated, the details not something I had come across in my mother's notes. Of course, I replied, trying to mimic what I imagined would be her nostalgic affection. Life just got in the way. Sergio's gaze intensified, his proximity a pressure I felt physically. Perhaps it's not too late to think about it again, he suggested, the implication clear in his hopeful tone. The evening wore on, and with each interaction, I felt increasingly like an actor who might be called out at any moment. The persona of Evangeline, once a mask that felt increasingly comfortable, now felt like a tightening vice. Each question from Sergio a turn of the screw. When the night finally drew to a close, and Sergio leaned in to whisper a goodbye that was too intimate, too laden with the past, I realized how dangerous this game was. Not just to the memory of my mother, or to the stability of her world, but to my own sense of self. As I watched him walk away, a mix of relief and confusion clouded my thoughts. Who was I in this web of old loves and hidden debts? Was I the son, Theo, clinging to fragments of his mother's secrets? Or was I Evangeline, caught in the echo of her heartbeats and whispered desires? The lines blurred, and in that blur, the fear of losing myself became as real as the persona I had so carefully constructed. The days following the gallery event were marked by a profound internal struggle, one that consumed both my waking thoughts and my restless nights. The boundaries between Theo and Evangeline began to blur, creating a turbulent sea of emotions and identities within me. Each morning as I donned the bodysuit and looked into the mirror, I saw less of myself and more of her, not just in appearance but in the essence of who I was becoming. I found myself walking her paths, speaking with her voice, and even thinking with her nuances. Conversations with friends and colleagues of Evangeline no longer required me to dig through memories or notes. Responses came naturally, as if her thoughts were my own. The duality of my existence was disorienting. Was I losing Theo in the process of keeping Evangeline alive? This merging of lives was not just an external performance. Emotionally, I felt a growing attachment to the parts of her life that she had cherished. Her love for art, her commitment to the gallery, and even her complex relationships. I caught myself smiling at a painting she adored, or feeling a pang of sadness when passing places she had mentioned in her letters. Her fears, her joys, and her sorrows were no longer just observed, they were felt, deeply and personally. The complexity of these emotions was overwhelming. There were moments when I felt a profound loneliness, a sense of being disconnected from my own self. Who was I if not the sum of my experiences? And if those experiences were not my own, what did that make me? The existential questions haunted me, 
each day drawing me deeper into an identity crisis that was both unnerving and enlightening. At times, the weight of carrying both identities felt like a betrayal to my own life. I missed the simplicity of being Theo, the unremarkable yet comforting routine of my own existence. Yet abandoning Evangeline's persona felt equally impossible. It was as if I was duty-bound to preserve her, to keep her alive through whatever means necessary. Amidst this internal chaos, there were moments of unexpected clarity. I realized that living as Evangeline allowed me to understand her in ways I never could have otherwise. Her strengths, her weaknesses, and her fears became apparent, painting a picture of a woman who was both formidable and deeply vulnerable. This understanding brought us closer, bridging the gap between mother and son, between the person she was publicly and the person she was privately. But with understanding came new challenges. The emotional and psychological implications of this dual existence began to manifest in subtle yet profound ways. I found my own preferences changing, influenced by hers, my own desires melding with what I knew were hers. The fusion of our lives was not just a superficial disguise, but a deep, transformative experience that reshaped everything I knew about identity, loyalty, and love. As I continued to navigate this complex reality, the struggle between maintaining my own identity while honoring hers became the central challenge of my days. The journey was isolating, yet illuminating, filled with both turmoil and tender revelations. In grappling with the duality of our lives, I was uncovering the essence of human connection, how deeply we can understand others, and through them, how deeply we come to understand ourselves. As the weeks melded into a seamless tapestry of living as Evangeline, the boundaries of my old life as Theo became distant memories, obscured by the intricate layers of her existence I was now navigating. However, a shocking discovery awaited me, one that would unravel the fabric of the narrative I had come to accept. It began with an innocuous enough afternoon. I was sorting through Evangeline's personal papers in her study, a routine that had become both a chore and a comfort, when I stumbled upon a series of correspondences that were out of place among the usual bills and gallery notices. These letters were carefully hidden beneath a false bottom in a drawer, an expertly concealed compartment that I had overlooked in my previous searches. Curiosity piqued, I examined the documents. They were recent and detailed communications between Evangeline and her brother, my Uncle Martin, a figure who had always been peripherally present in our lives, his interactions with us sparse and generally unremarkable. As I delved deeper into the letters, a chilling narrative unfolded. Martin spoke of the bodysuit with a familiarity that was startling. He detailed its functions and the potential it held, not just for deception, but for complete identity usurpation. He hinted at a plan, one that involved Evangeline disappearing. A temporary measure, he assured, to alleviate her from the burdens that had accumulated in her life. But the letters revealed more than just a temporary disappearance. They discussed substantial financial transactions and transfers of assets that were to be managed by Martin during her absence. The tone of his words was cold, calculated. There was an underlying greed that seeped through his reassurances of caring for her well-being. The realization hit me with the force of a physical blow. The bodysuit, the opportunity to step into Evangeline's life. Had it all been orchestrated? Was I not just preserving her legacy, but unknowingly aiding in a sinister plot crafted by her own brother? Feelings of betrayal and horror mingled with a deep sense of violation. The trust I had placed in the narrative of her needing a break, the emotional journey I had embarked on to connect with her, felt tainted. How much of what I had come to learn about her and about myself in the process was manipulated by Martin's schemes. I sat back, the papers rustling softly under my trembling hands. The weight of the deception was overwhelming, and for a moment I was paralyzed by the enormity of the implications. My role as Evangeline, which had started as a mission of preservation, now felt like an unwitting complicity in fraud. Determined to confront the truth and protect what was left of my mother's dignity and legacy, I knew what I had to do. Martin needed to be exposed, and the reasons behind my mother's disappearance fully uncovered. 
the sense of purpose steadied me. I would use the persona of Evangeline not as a mask to hide behind, but as a shield to bring to light the truth and to fight back against the machinations that had sought to undermine our family. This was no longer just about maintaining an identity. It was about justice, about reclaiming the narrative that had been so deceitfully woven around my mother's life and mine. As the pieces of the puzzle fell disturbingly into place, the weight of my decision loomed large. The dual life I led had entangled me in a web of relationships and responsibilities that were originally Evangeline's, but now felt inextricably mine. The revelation about Uncle Martin's deceit forced me into a corner, and each path before me bristled with profound consequences. Sitting alone in the quiet of Evangeline's study, surrounded by the artifacts of her life and the documents that revealed the betrayal, I felt the pressure of the imminent decision I had to make. To continue this charade would protect the esteemed image of Evangeline Donatelli, preserving the integrity of her life's work and the gallery that bore her soul. Yet every day spent under the guise of the bodysuit meant perpetuating a lie that benefited a man whose greed knew no bounds. The alternative was fraught with risks, revealing the truth about Martin's plot and the reality of my identity as Theo wearing Evangeline's form would likely scandalize the community and could potentially destroy the reputation my mother had built. Furthermore, my personal relationships, particularly the complex and rekindled connection with Sergio, added layers of emotional complexity to the decision. Sergio had become an unexpected confidant, someone who had known Evangeline intimately and who, over the past weeks, had grown to know me in her guise. Our relationship, born from a shared history that was both real and fabricated, had evolved into something deeply meaningful. Confessing the truth to him and the world meant risking the loss of this newfound closeness, or worse, turning it into something tainted by deception and manipulation. Each option swirled in my mind, battling for dominance. The facade of Evangeline provided a shield, but it was a shield forged from lies. As I pondered, my gaze fell upon a photograph of my mother, her smile captured in a moment of genuine happiness. It struck me then, Evangeline had always been about authenticity, about bringing truth to light through her art. Could I do any less with her life? My resolve hardened. The legacy Evangeline truly deserved wasn't one of continued deceit, but one of integrity. She had taught me to stand for what was right, even if the path was fraught with challenges. It was time to bring the truth into the open, to confront Martin and to reveal the machinations behind the bodysuit to the authorities, the art community, and to those I had come to care about. I reached for the phone, my fingers steady as I dialed Sergio's number. The conversation we were about to have would be the most difficult of my life, but it was necessary. As I waited for him to answer, I rehearsed my words, each one laden with the gravity of truth and the hope of forgiveness. The path I chose would not be easy, but it was the only one that could possibly lead to redemption and justice. It was time for Theo to step out from behind Evangeline's shadow and confront the world with all the complexities and challenges that the truth would bring. The evening of the major art exhibition was electric, charged with anticipation and the vibrant energy of a crowd gathered to celebrate the latest successes of Evangeline Donatelli. The gallery was alive, lit brilliantly, and filled with the murmurs of art lovers, critics, and collectors. As Theo, Hidden beneath the meticulous guise of Evangeline, I circulated among the guests, each step heavy with the weight of the decision I had made. As the clock neared the hour of the main presentation, my heart raced with a mix of dread and determination. I knew that what I was about to do would change everything, my life, the memory of my mother, and the lives of all who had known her. The gallery quieted as I took the stage, the spotlight harsh as it illuminated not just Evangeline's form, but also the facade I was about to tear down. I stand before you tonight, not just as the curator of this wonderful exhibition, I began, my voice steady despite the trembling of my hands, but also as someone who has been living a truth that needs to be shared. The room fell into a hushed stillness, the air thick with tension and curiosity. I continued, 
revealing the truth about the bodysuit, about Martin's machinations, and most crucially, about who I truly was. Theo, Evangeline's son, who had been carrying her legacy in the most literal way imaginable. The revelation sent shockwaves through the room. There were gasps, murmurs of disbelief, and an audible reaction from Uncle Martin, who had been lurking in the back. The aftermath of the announcement was chaotic, a storm of emotions and questions that I struggled to navigate. In the weeks that followed, the legal battles began. Martin was charged with fraud and other criminal activities related to his plot to seize Evangeline's assets. The proceedings were grueling, a public airing of family grievances and secrets that had long been buried. Throughout it all, I stood firm, bolstered by the support of those who understood and empathized with the bizarre circumstances I had found myself in. Emotionally, the period was one of intense reconciliation, Sergio, who had been stunned by the revelation, eventually came to understand the depth of my predicament and offered his support. Our relationship, altered irrevocably, found a new footing, one built on genuine understanding and the shared grief of having been manipulated by Martin. The experience forced me into a deep introspection about identity and gender. Living as Evangeline had taught me more about my mother than I had ever known when she was alive. It had also blurred the lines of my own identity, challenging my understanding of gender roles and the fluidity of personal truth. I had to reconcile not only with who Evangeline was, but also with who Theo was in the aftermath of her legacy. Ultimately, the resolution of these tumultuous events brought a sense of peace. The art community, initially shocked, gradually came to recognize the courage it took to unveil the truth. The gallery remained a beacon of art and truth, a tribute to Evangeline's legacy, and a testament to the resilience of the human spirit to overcome deceit and adversity. In the quiet moments, looking at the artworks that had once been curated by Evangeline and then by me as her, I realized that identity is not just who we are in public or in private, but a complex tapestry woven from the roles we choose to accept and the truths we dare to reveal. My journey as Evangeline had ended, but the journey of understanding and embracing the myriad facets of myself and my mother had just begun. As the legal battles settled and the dust of public scrutiny began to dissipate, I found myself standing in the midst of the gallery that had once been a battlefield of identities and truths. The walls, adorned with the vibrant and thought-provoking works that Evangeline had loved, seemed to echo with the remnants of the past few months' turmoil and transformation. But there was peace, too, a profound sense of resolution that permeated the space. In this final scene of my unexpected journey, I stood before a newly commissioned piece, a portrait of Evangeline, captured not just as the public figure she was, but as the mother I had known and discovered anew. Her eyes, painted with a depth that seemed almost knowing, followed me as I moved around the room, a silent witness to the legacy she had left behind and the changes it had wrought in me. I had returned to living as Theo, my true physical form, but the experiences I had lived through as Evangeline were now an indelible part of me. They had reshaped my perspectives on life, identity, and the fluid interplay between public personas and private truths. The journey had taught me more about my mother's strength, her vulnerabilities, and her indomitable spirit than I had ever known while she was alive. It had also unveiled my own capacities for empathy, resilience, and adaptation. With a deep sense of gratitude and a renewed purpose, I decided to take steps to integrate the best parts of Evangeline's life and values into my own. The gallery, once a symbol of my mother's external achievements, would continue under my management but with a new focus. It would not only serve as a space for art, but also as a center for community outreach and education, reflecting both my mother's passion for art and my dedication to inclusivity and truth. Additionally, I initiated an annual scholarship in Evangeline's name, aimed at supporting young artists who explored themes of identity and transformation in their work. This initiative was my way of honoring her legacy while nurturing a new generation of artists who dared to question and redefine the boundaries of self-expression. In my personal life, 
I found a balance that allowed me to embrace and express the lessons I had learned from being Evangeline without losing my own identity. Relationships that had been strained by the revelations and the ensuing chaos were slowly rebuilt, stronger and more honest than before. My friendship with Sergio evolved into a mutual respect for each other's journey through deception to discovery, each finding solace in the shared experience of having loved Evangeline in our own ways. As I stood in the gallery watching visitors engage with the art, I felt a connection to both my own identity and Evangeline's, a synthesis of our spirits. The closing image of this chapter of my life was one of reconciliation and hope, a vision of a future where the essence of who we were individually could coexist and enrich the broader tapestry of our shared human experience. In this reflective moment, I realized that true identity is not just about the roles we are given or the roles we choose. It is also about the meanings we create from the experiences we endure and the legacies we choose to leave behind.